Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora koutou katoa. Good evening everyone and warm welcome. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Grant Gilbert, Vice-Chancellor of Victoria. It's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Marianne van der Belt to the role of uh, Assistant Vice-Chancellor of Sustainability and of course to Victoria University's community. Marianne takes over the reins from Emeritus Professor Charles Doherty, who after doing a wonderful job as Victoria's and New Zealand's first Assistant Vice-Chancellor of Sustainability has retired after three decades of wonderful service to this university. So it's an honour to have Marianne take up this extremely important role. She has over 25 years of experience as a researcher and consultant on national and international projects in the sustainability sector. She comes to us uh, most recently from Massey University in Palmerston North, where she was the Director of Ecological and Economics Research New Zealand. In this role, she had led a number of successful initiatives working in partnership with local and central government, iwi and communities to address issues such as freshwater management and urban sustainability. Marianne brings with her a wealth of experience across research, management and governance roles, as well as a deep-seated passion for sustainability issues. She has worked in a number of countries, including Sweden, the United States and her whenua, the Netherlands. Marianne is well known for her commitment to the environment. She has published and spoken extensively on sustainability and most recently uh, provided a keynote speech at the UNESCO for World Oceans Day in Paris last year. Now, Victoria University is committed to sustainability. Our commitment to sustainability is one of the ways we manifest our core ethical values of respect, responsibility, fairness, integrity and empathy. Enhancing the resilience and sustainability of our natural heritage and natural capital is one of the small number of specific areas of academic emphasis chosen by the university. This academic emphasis is expressed in our research and our teaching, but also in the way we conduct ourselves. We were the first university in New Zealand to initiate divestment from carbon emitting fossil fuels, joining what was then a fledgling movement, but is now a $3.4 trillion global event. We took this action to align our investment priorities with results of our research and our public stance on climate change, the single biggest challenge to face the biosphere. I'm equally proud to witness on a daily basis the progress we make in reducing our own environmental footprint with support from staff and students. We've made great steps in the right direction and we were awarded the Leadership and Carbon Reduction Awards in the Australasian 2015 Green Gown Awards. The latter award recognised the determined efforts that have seen the university's total carbon emissions reduced by 12 per cent since 2007, despite a growing campus. Under Marianne's leadership, I look forward to seeing this momentum continue and our influence expand further in the community on issues to do with sustainability. Marianne, I know I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues when I say we're delighted to have someone of your calibre join us at Victoria. Please welcome Marianne to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Chancellor. Um, it's a pleasure, obviously, to, for me to be here. Uh, thank you all uh, who have taken the time out today to be uh, present here. I know we have lots of other things to do. Um, and that shows a commitment, and, and that's exactly what I uh, would like to talk to you about today. This is only the second day of, um, of, of my position. Um, I started yesterday, and I, I just wanted to, um, well, first of all, I think it's the best job in New Zealand. Um, and, and secondly, um, I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity to introduce myself to you. To this community. Uh, so this is not going to be a talk about uh, content of sustainability. I don't need to lecture you anything on that. You probably know that already. What's more important is who am I and who, you know, who just came into your, your door here. What a wonderful opportunity I've been given to, to lead this Kuriru on sustainability. It's, it's a very unique, as you already pointed out, uh, position and to, to be in the you know pan university uh, space is, is absolutely unique and I'm sure the envy of many universities not only in New Zealand but abroad as well um, 
Many pieces are already in place, as was pointed out. I just wanted to uh, especially um, uh, thank uh, Andrew Wilkes for all the hard work you've done. It's absolutely amazing because the fact that you have done that is, is making this possible. We're now ready to take the next step. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, three things I hope you will get out of the conversation of today. First of all, I want to um, uh, talk about the values and how Victorian values align, align with my own values. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that I do know that we have many points of connections already. And this is an opportunity to start thinking about what those could be. And then we can very quickly uh, meet and, um, and, and give some effect to that. And finally, I hope that I, uh, I can entertain you tonight. So in terms of the values, uh, the values that um, Victoria has, and I think I can remember them now, respect, responsibility, fairness, mm, integrity, and... Mm, empathy, empathy, empathy. Empathy is an interesting one. I always think of compassion in that sense, instead of empathy, because that tells you, it's not just you feel what other people feel, but you walk in their shoes besides them. And I think that's, so that's why empathy is All right, so those are, those are really important. Those are kind of the roots that um, feed the tree of the organization, of the institution, that uphold what Maori call kawa, the, the, the balance of life. And so those underlying values are really important. Integrity is my, um, is my favorite. Uh, Buckminster Fuller says, integrity is the essence of everything successful. And, and I, I really like that, uh, that statement. So let me see, where's my clicker? Now we really get started. Oh, here. This is where I grew up. I grew up under the, um, in the Netherlands, in a suburb near, uh, near Rotterdam, pretty much under the smokestacks of the Royal Dutch Shell refinery. Not the prettiest place. Um, and, and often the air was so bad we had to stay inside and, and just so this is uh, this is where i grew up this is the apartment block where i grew up it's amazing what you can find when i grew up there we didn't even have google now you can find where you were where you grew up you can, you can just find it there so it wasn't all that bad because look at this apartment block you see all these um these mailboxes there they have bells next to them so when you're a six seven year old and you want to play, you go, you know, you press 120 bells, and within five minutes, you have a game. And then the negotiations start, because that is when we have to decide what the game's going to be. Now, one of my favorite games was, um, let's call it an observation game, where uh, we would sort of roam the streets, six, seven-year-olds, and we would look for people who would throw away the garbage. We threw away the ice wrappers or the secret pots. And then we would pick it up and we would sneakily sort of spy after them and go and see where they would live. And then in our newly uh, found skill of writing notes, we would sort of make important business and write a note. Would you please not pollute our street? And in the mailbox then went the ice wrapper and the, and the, uh, and the little note. So um, I, I'm, I have to warn you, I'm still a little bit of that. Well, I just hope that my, uh, my methods have refined by now. My childhood hero in uh, uh, growing up in, uh, in the apartment block was Jacques Cousteau. Uh, he brought into our, uh, our living rooms the, uh, the underwater world. I was absolutely fascinated by this. So when I was about, I think it was 27, I got to meet Jacques Cousteau in Paris at a workshop at, uh, at UNESCO. And um, he asked me, so what are you interested in? He said, sustainable development. He said, sustainable development doesn't exist. And so within 10 seconds, I had a heated debate with my childhood hero about whether sustainable development was something or not. And you know what? He had a point. He was actually right, because his big question was, what is it exactly that you're trying to sustain? So what is it? And um, so we had a, a, a big a bit of a back and forth about it. The other point that he was um, 
that came across quite clearly. Well, first of all, what are you trying to sustain in a system that's constantly changing and dynamic? The other thing was he was uh, well, pessimistic, I think, about the faith of humanity. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the, uh, um, the metaphor of people like uh, bacteria in a petri dish. Yeah? People in a petri dish, oh, people in a petri dish. Yeast bacteria in a petri dish. Um, they kind of eat through their, their food, and then they eat each other, and then they die. And so it, it was kind of the uh, a rather pessimistic view, I think, that, that Jacques had about people and, and how we behaved on Earth. Uh, and I, it's, I am of the convic conviction that we have a choice in this, whether we do or don't. I don't see it that, that um, negatively as, as he did. All right. Here's my mom. Here's my, my father was my inspiration when it came to nat natural stuff. Um, my mom was an inspiration because she, well, my parents divorced when I was 12, and uh, she held three jobs and, uh, and studied at the same time. Um, and we, our household became a bit of a, um, uh, a safe haven sometimes for women from the neighborhood uh, coming to us and talking about uh, how their lives were going, and especially the economics of it was always a big hurdle. And so when I had the, uh, well, the choice whether to study biology and, and follow a passion or study economics, I actually studied economics because I wanted to know how this system worked in order to you know, really understand it. And that's what I did. I learned a lot. I learned a lot of um, tools. And I also learned that there is a lot of in, hmm, inconsistency in the, within the theory. It doesn't quite work as far as I'm concerned. Why not? Because it all pre pretends or assumes that we live on a, on a planet that's infinite. And in fact, we don't. We already know that we're in a major overshoot situation. Now, for some people, this seems to mean that we now have to go and look for other planets. Uh, for me, it means that we actually should start managing ourselves so that we can live uh, in harmony on this one. Technology is, is quite advanced at the moment. The more we know about the Earth, the worse it looks. Yeah? And so this is one example, planetary boundaries. Uh, yeah, who has not heard of planetary boundaries? Yes, I would suspect so. So, that is the basis of it. What I want to do now is tell you five short stories uh, that sort of exemplify my journey to come here. Um, I could have, there's probably a thousand stories I could have chosen, but I've chosen these in order to give you a flavor of the type of strategy that I'm thinking about at the moment. Yeah, so they underpin that, nothing else. And if you want to hear more stories or more content, just invite me for a cup of coffee or a lecture. And I'm happy to talk. Uh, okay. So, eco ecological economics. One day, as an economist, I ran into uh, a conference in, in Stockholm uh, of the Society for Ecological Economics, and that's where I found my tribe. I was home. <laughs> and so, what is ecological economics? It, uh, it, it talks about, well, it's a transdisciplinary field of inquiry. So it doesn't even want to be a, a, a discipline. Yeah? So it deliberately uh, uses multiple disciplines and finds effective ways to, to do so. Um, there are three pillars uh, for an ecological economist. There, first, there is the ecologically sustainable scale. So let's find uh, um, the right scale for this human subsystem within a larger um, ecosystem. Secondly, fairness of distribution. So here we have the, uh, the, uh, one of the key values of Victoria reflected again. Uh, and thirdly, efficient, economically efficient allocation. Now for an ecological economist, that really means um, that we're looking for the design of new tools in order to answer the pertinent questions. If you're an environmental economist, then you tend to take the economic toolkit 
and apply them on environmental topics. Ecological economics is more of a design arm. We use a lot of systems, systems thinking, and those type of tools. That's a, a slightly, well, it's actually fundamentally different. Um, social capital, the way we interact with each other, I would also put in that the creative capitals, human capitals, the, the institutions, how we solve in complex issues, build capital, and put financial capital there uh, in too as well, if you have to. More on that later. Um, now I'm going to tell you some stories, how I started, how I got into, you know, I discovered ecological economics, and I am a, uh, I was trained as an economist at least, and I, at that point in Sweden, was running my own consulting company. Mm. And I was asked for Conservation International, funded by World um, Global Environment Facility, to go to uh, Argentina and help them with their coastal zone management plan. They had just been working on this for uh, a few years, and I looked at penguins and how they reproduce and how they, all those biological work. They had looked at uh, fisheries and, and discard and bycatch and all that stuff. And I said, now we're kind of at the end of this program. Let's do an uh, economic impact uh, analysis. And I, I was asked to, uh, to, to go and do that. And I said, so I was asked to look at these different sectors and look at the impact, uh, economic impact of that locally. And I said, well, I can do this pretty much from Sweden. I don't have to go to Argentina to do that. That's pretty much the best work. So would you be open to the idea of me taking a different approach? At that time, I had also followed a course at, um, at Stockholm University because I also wanted to work toward a PhD uh, on modeling, system dynamics modeling. And so without any much experience other than making every example in a particular textbook, I went to Argentina and started working with the information I had gathered and with the people and putting this together into a model that started to look at the relationships between those different sectors and the natural environment. And what we found then, by, by sort of really putting the pieces together, was that had they done this at the beginning of the, uh, of the program, they would have designed their research qu quite differently in a way that um, would have answered a few more questions. For example, um, they were looking at penguins and their reproductive uh, you know, rates and, and how well they were reprodu reproducing based on, for example, the, the thickness of, their, um, of the shells, things like that. Um, but these penguins need to feed, and they feed on anchovy during the time of when they are rearing their chicks, for example. And if you then have these big freezer factories come through and empty the sea, not a lot of food there. So on one hand, they were doing that type of work anyway, looking at fisheries. And on the other hand, the penguins, they hadn't quite put it together. So they were, by just doing this scoping exercise, we found a few things that they could have done more efficiently. The other thing was once we put it together, we had a few uh, insights of things that were about to happen. First of all, um, it was clear that the fish stock was in trouble. And yes, two years later, the egg population did collapse. Um, the penguin story I already told you that became a, a PhD. And then research out of that was published in Nature uh, six, seven years later. And if they would have had an oil spill in the wrong time, in the wrong place, that would have wiped out the penguin colony. Um, and that was their main growing income, source of income. Now, the oil spill happened, just luckily not in the time when the penguins were home. Yeah? So, by using this scoping approach, you can get quite a lot of information, a lot of consensus across the disciplines. So with that, I uh, had an opportunity to go and study at the University of Vermont, um, sorry, University of Maryland, Vermont comes later, um, with Herman Daly. Herman Daly is quite well known for his steady state economics. 
Wow, so he's, he's into designing an economy that is not dependent on growth. And so he comes down to conclusions like, hmm, if you tax things, you want to tax the bads, not the goods. So if you want employment, then don't tax employment. Tax pollution if you don't want that. And so he plays with that, um, uh, with that concept set of steady state economics. So he's, on top of that, he's a delightful man to work with. And uh, not that I worked on, on that particular topic, because I finally got my chance to study marine, um, marine work. Uh, so I did oceanography, biological, physical oceanography, lots of modeling courses, modeling the social and the natural sciences, um, landscape ecology. It was like learning lots of new different languages. And also, I did a course in social psychology, because that's the flexibility that, um, that this program allowed. And that was great, because I was working on this, this new concept of mediated modeling, using model building with people, rather than building a model for people. Yeah? So it's all about bringing people together and have something to hang up their perspectives, something to, ha to test what the facts are versus what the beliefs are. And, and sort of facilitate that the dialogue um, and giving that some structure. So that was published with a couple of more ca case studies um, into a book published by Island Press. Um, and I've done quite a lot of case studies ever since. So that was probably the reason why I was hired uh, to come to New Zealand for this particular skill. And seven years of science leadership on MB funded programs where we expanded its toolkit into now spatially dynamic models um, and a better understanding of how organizations work with these tools. Because these tools don't make decisions, people make decisions. Yeah? And so when to use what tool, what tool is really important, who uses it, and, and what are they going to do with it? Uh, and also come to the conclusion that it's not about the biggest, baddest models. It's about the agility that we, we have to assimilate the appropriate type of data in order to get an action and, and get going with it. Because that, in the end, is what we want. We want change. Oh, by the way, I'm currently working on a book that does all that uh, on modeling for transitioning societies. That's the, uh, the working title for it. Another story, then. This is where I discovered the power of groups of people. Uh, again, I was a, an independent consultant and for World Wildlife Fund, I was asked to go to Trinidad and Tobago um, to, to think about uh, if it was possible to create an, um, a community-based pollutant release and transfer register. That means keeping track of, the, of the, uh, certain chem chemicals. Yeah? So they come into the island, they go into products, they go into waste, etc. There wasn't anything like that, and there was an unfortunate uh, incident where um, a battery smelter had uh, moved its waste, supposedly to a, a, a legal place. But as it came through a village where the roads weren't paved and everything, the villagers said, that's you know, an interesting load you have there, you're just going to put that on the landfill. Why don't you put it on a road? So here was mercury waste that ended up paving the road of a village, which killed a few children, which paralyzed a lot of children, and is simply not okay. So that was the context in which I um, arrived and interviewed uh, top-level people at 23 organizations across businesses, um, government, NGOs, and they all wanted something. They just weren't always wanting it in the same way. Now, it had been my task to write the strategy, which I did, and then go off to, uh, uh, to Washington, D.C. to present that and see if we could get some funding to help these people. There's a new one. Why not bring these people together and see what happens? Because clearly they have common ground. And I worked with the University of Port of Spain, and I said, <laughs> they're going to kill each other if you put those in one room. That's not going to work. 
So well, let's see. Let, you know, we've got three days. Uh, let's see what happens. And lo and behold, they all came when they invited. And I said, I, you know, here it is. You all seem to want this in some way, one way or the other. And uh, it's up to you. And I said, yeah, we want this. And so without even having to, oh, there was one lawyer who didn't have the mandate, he thought, for his company to commit to it. But on the spot, they committed that they were going to do this themselves anyway, regardless of what was funding was going to come from Washington, D.C. But that's powerful. It's really powerful. And so that is one of those, um, that's where I kind of discovered that. Um, you see it as a red thread through other things. This is, um, I call it materializing my worldview through co-creation. This is in, in Vermont by now. It's a co-housing eco-village. Um, that I started. It was great to do that when my children were little. And um, this was really just from vision. This was created with, by people coming together with like-minded um, ideas. And um, there was this piece of land, 120 acres, that was going to be cut up in five-acre lots. Uh, and so what we did, we, we managed to buy it and, and create a village on eight, eight acres. It really have that village, recreate that village feel. The infrastructure was very much designed to enhance the social capital, to enhance that people would meet each other uh, and interact with each other, have a common house so that not everybody needed uh, their own separate guest room, but you know, could have shared guest rooms. So we built fairly small for American standards, at least. Um, tried to incorporate all the... Um, environmental friendly uh, options that we could possibly think of. We, did, we couldn't get all of them, but we tried. And we worked through a particular governance system called sociocracy, which is really interesting. It seemed to work much better than consensus, which was, I was used to before, because it has a safety valve. You can only object things if there is reason and paramount objections. Yeah? <laughs> that makes sense, but on the consensus, everybody has to feel that it is right. Um, and I have to admit, I ran out of patience with that. Yeah. I mean, it's fine, but I do want some reason and empowerment objections. And there's always an opportunity to come back and revisit it again and change the scheme. It's quite an interesting uh, way of working, and it's, it's very effective, and you get a fairly wide uh, spread of communities, um, you know, committee structure for particular tasks. Yeah. And so that's one of the approaches I'm hoping to, uh, to apply here as well. Just some pretty pictures here. Very multi-age, young people, old people uh, work together quite well. We also had an affordable, um, af affordable housing scheme. So there were some affordable units that would always in perpetuity remain uh, affordable. We had community supported agriculture. So there was an on-site farmer who would get a basic income regardless of what the uh, production was. So we shared a little bit in the risk uh, of, of this farmer. Um, and then we had a sister project in Burlington. That was, I just pulled that up because it's a, an urban, uh, an example of an urban uh, village. And, and again, I, I, I don't see why we couldn't do things like this more in, uh, in Wellington. Yeah, let me explore that some further. Ah, oh, here's the messy logo. <laughs> My fourth uh, story is about uh, learning and, and how and teaching and how I got to that. So, uh, part of getting through university was by teaching at a polytech economics, and the main insight there was that people who don't want to learn, who are not motivated, do not learn. Uh, fast forward now to about '94, and I started with um, I did a course with Bob Costanza. You probably where who Bob Costanza is. In, as an ecological economist, he's, he's quite, uh, quite well known. And um, we did this course in South Africa. We call it an atelier. Uh, it really means that the, the master works alongside the students. So it's not, we don't, we, it's not like we teach you something and then you give it back to us. We work with you and students learn alongside. 
There were also a lot of st um, partners, stakeholders involved at that point. Uh, we took a particular topic, which was uh, the Kobelberg area was nominated to be dammed. Uh, and so the question was, why sh should we or should we not dam this area? Uh, and we created a course around that. About 40 people participated. I would say five, six staff uh, and mm. at least 10 or so <coughs> stakeholders as well. And my, t my part in that is, uh, has always been, ever since, uh, running an open space exercise. Uh, people know what open space is? No? Oh, a little bit. So it's, it's, the, you, it's the creation of a market space of ideas. So what you do is you, you create a circle of, um, where people can come in one by one and declare what they're most passionate about. Yeah? And then you create a, a title and a place to meet, etc. And that goes on the wall. And anybody can come with their ideas. And when it's all done, you have a whole marketplace of ideas. And people can then go and sign up to participate and, and collaborate on that idea. And what happens in, is a very organic way of working with students and, and people's motivation around a particular topic. I couldn't figure those topics out for them. It just, excuse me, happens. So there's a, a few rules on that. The convener does not own the, uh, the idea. It's, it's there to grow organically. Um, whoever comes to your project is the right uh, person to come to your project, and you work with that. And finally, the law of two feet. When you're no longer, or if you're no longer, contributing to the conversation, you're honor bound to leave and maybe find another group or start your own project. Now the fourth thing is, it's always time bound, so there's an end game to this. Yeah? And what happens is that people really work very, very hard to come to that deliverable. It's high pressure, you use their full motivation and their output. Now that's the type of teaching I've done since 94 in, in various, various ways. Mm. And I always get an output. I mean, at, at Messi, I run these things uh, in the last four or five years. And you, you always get a publishable output out of it. So it's highly productive. It's a great opportunity for students who usually haven't published anything to go through the whole process of learning some basic tools, being exposed to stakeholders and their issues, and then work alongside their, 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 the faculty and or um, partners, uh, councils, for example, to come up with real solutions. Give them another three, four weeks to finish the paper, and voila, it works. It sounds like chaos, but it, it actually does work. Um, and so there are lots of these approaches, living labs, social labs, charrettes, design charrettes, they all have that same key ingredient, making use of people's uh, motivation naturally. And I'm sure there's a lot of this going on already. I know Provost Wendy Lerner here is doing a, um, a, a stock take of teaching and the type of teaching that's already happening. So I'm looking much forward to see what, what information comes out of that so we can start to use that in that sustainability team as well. Four story. You still with me? Yes? All right, changing conversations, because that's what we want. We want to shift, change the conversations, right? So one tool, one approach in that is ecosystem services. It's a very ecological economics. Who has heard of ecosystem services? Yeah? Oh, yeah, a few people. So it shifts the focus away from um, the impacts that we have on the environment to the benefits that we get from the environment. So in that sense, there's already a shift in, your, in, um, uh, in conversation. Now, I've worked on that since the late 90s. Started with Bob Costanza with a, a big impact a paper in Nature, which, by the way, became the second most cited paper in environmental science ever. Um, and since then, uh, well, I, I've recently finished um, a, a chapter that I led for the uh, United Nations World Oceans Assessment on ecosystem services. I play on um, IPBES, Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So those are all academic conversations, yes? And if, we, if you talk to Bethana Jackson here at, uh, at the university, 
She, too, she can model these things quite well. But what happens if you only use these concepts with Iwi on the ground in, in a community? Yeah? What happens then? Is it possible? And I'd say, yes, it is. Because then you start to translate. You have to communicate in a completely different way. So here are my ecosystem services. Yeah, we have the provisioning services, the regulating services, supporting services, and the cultural services. Now when Iwi then says, okay, cultural services, that's central for us. Yeah, and that includes recreation and spiritual values and, and all those things. Um, the provisioning service, food, water, medicine, yeah, we recognize that. It looks like that. Um, regulating services, water supply, storm protection, uh, pollination, uh, climate, uh, climate control, all of these regulating services, yeah, we understand that too. Um, and the supporting services, yeah, they look like that. So then you get the same concept, but fundamentally translated. And why this is so helpful, every time there is a particular challenge going on, such as the flooding that happened in Wanganui uh, recently, it's like, oh, that's a service nature provides as well. What can we do to get more of those benefits? Yeah? And so you create stories that enhance, that sort of focus on the enhancement of the benefits we get from nature. So it's really an organizing principle. This was done, uh, I, I recent, actually I, I finished this on Saturday with um, uh, Narauru. That's the, the Iwi that I worked with over the last 18 months or so. Uh, on a project that was called Social Ecological Entrepreneurship. Businesses so that people and nature matter. Um, and the idea was as follows. And that's what the pictures you see here. Um, what is a breach? What is something fundamentally wrong? A breach in Kawa. And one, one, um, uh, one person said, actually, one breach would be that she used to harvest watercress from that stream. And she can't do it anymore because it's too polluted. And so she grows it in her backyard. And so we said, okay, what kind of products could you possibly create out of watercress? Uh, it's a highly nutritious micronutrient. Uh, and so they got all excited and, and they, we came up with a challenge on creating different products out of watercress. And so it became um, pestos, uh, creams, lollies, all kinds of things they came up with. It's quite exciting. But by now, we, um, well, they, <laughs> they have uh, created a pilot project out of this and it actually is going to go to, most likely it's going to go to uh, become a commercial product out of this, which is going to generate profits with the understanding, and this is absolutely key, that those profits will be reinvested in solving the, pro the problem that, that originated that idea. So it's about giving back to the environment and restoring that. So from the word go, social ecological entrepreneurship is built on the premises that yeah, you can make money and you can do all that, but it's in order in part to restore. And I think, personally, that, that is a great marketing tool because people want to be part of something positive. Yeah? So if you buy this product, which I'm not going to say what it is, um, you're not just buying that. You're buying the fact that you're helping restore that stream in a particular place. And that's exciting. Yeah? All right. Now, in the end, stretch them. Um, sustainability is a multi-scale challenge. Yeah? Sprawling here. Auckland, anybody? Yeah? Greenhouses in Spain, as far as the eye can see, but this, it affects us. This is how food is produced these days. And if we are in that market, we have to understand these things. Oil wells in California, we're fracking in the Manawatu for the last drops of oil with the risk of polluting our water. Yeah? Uh, this, Vancouver, but could be anywhere in New Zealand, really. Um, this irrigation schemes, Tuki Tuki Dam, Hawkesbury, yeah. All of that because we're completely addicted to shopping. Oh, sorry. Yes, so sustainability is also very personal. For me, this, this haunts me at night. 
it, it, I am terribly upset by the fact that it's projected by 2050 we have as much plastic in the oceans in weight as we have fish. That, that is just not okay. It's not. And, and then birds look like that. They starve hungry with plastic in their stomach. And this is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And this is not in some polluted area. So this keeps me up at night. And so plastic for me is very... We do everything we can to not use plastic. It's a personal commitment. That's where the integrity comes in. Go the extra length. And everybody has their own personal um, ways of, of contributing to that. But this gets me up in the morning. That's what excites me about it. The fact that there are, um, you know, oh, we live in, a, in, a, in a Wellington now, which wants to be a biophilic uh, city. Yeah? And, and so it excites me that you can do this with buildings as well, not just, you know, in, in, in places. But you can integrate this into buildings. You can think of buildings as watersheds that produce water, not that produce problems with stormwater. You can actually turn these things around, and that's creative. France has just passed a law where you can no longer have a normal, build a house with a normal roof. It has to have solar, or it has to have a green roof. That's cool. Look at all the things that are going to happen out of that. And, yeah, of course, I like edible gardens because I have, I'm going to be leaving one at home in Palmerston North. Um, the Netherlands, for example, they're paving their bike paths with solar panels. Why? In part because they've made a commitment that, in, I think it's 2025, you can no longer buy cars that run on gasoline. What do you think this is going to do? This is lots of opportunities. In Wellington, we're still bickering, evidently, about whether there should be a bike path. <laughs> there, they're paving it in solar panels. <laughs> Who's going to have the competitive advantage? Yes? And so these are just quirky things in Zurich. They're building um, algae production in infrastructure where it soaks up the CO2 of, uh, of cars. That's not commercial, but it's quirky. Yeah, either they can use it when they go to another planet, or we can learn something from it. Yeah? Well, we have to be careful always. I, I promised in my title I would talk about paradoxes. The Jevons paradox. Who knows what the Jevons paradox? Ah, yeah. It says, must be an economist. No? <laughs> Jevons paradox basically talks about when you become more efficient at using uh, an actual resource, turns out you start using more of it anyway. So we have to be really cognizant when we come up with the brilliant solutions that we look at it from a systems perspective, that there are no unintended consequences to the type of solutions that we put forward, that we always look at that, you know, that balance. Anyway, where are solutions? This is another um, uh, organizing principle. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals just came online this year. And um, we had a representative of this network uh, coming to visit us a few weeks ago. And I think we decided that we will sign on as well, as many universities do. But it doesn't don't do anything, does it? The question is, what is it that we're going to do with this as a university? Behind each of these boxes here, poverty, uh, gender equality, Renewable energy, climate, climate, we're good at climate here, actually, here, right? or climate change, at least. There's a lot of research going on here. Um, there's a whole community, a whole disciplines under that. For me, what's important is this is an opportunity to look again across those boxes. How are we going to organize ourselves so we can really be at the cutting edge with bigger solutions? And how are we going to assemble those quickly? Yeah? In a timely fashion. <clears throat> not, that, not that I want to say take away from the analysis, but it would be really good if we can also start looking at synthesis, the art and science of putting things together. Of course, I will always uh, keep an eye on that one, economic growth. Because I'm, I'm fine with economic growth as long as there's real value behind it. Not economic growth for the sake of economic growth. And we have currently a financial system 
which is rather dysfunctional, rather dysfunctional, rather than it being a lubricant allowing the uh, exchange between goods and services, it has now become a growth game in itself. And that is fundamentally unhealthy. And it is going to change. We don't even have to, it's just going to not continue to exist in that particular way. So my question is, how do we use this as an organizing principle to really do sustainability well? And do that well across the research, the teaching, and the, and the um, engagement. Yeah? Research, teaching, engagement, always those three. So I see it as the task of the sustainability office to look at that triage yeah, look and, and, make, and, and look at it through a sustainability lens. Not everything, just, you know, what, is it, what, does, it, what does this mean through a sustainability lens? Um, so that means, not, oh, there's a whole smorgasbord of ideas that, that I come up with and come with you. Not that I think we will all do this, but that is kind of a starting point to, to, to start the conversations with you. Um, and of course, this is Victoria and how we organize ourselves, and then we engage with our partners in society. And there's a lot of going on already. Uh, two days ago, an MOU was signed between Victoria University and Zealandia to start a research center on urban ecology. And a great opportunity to build on the good work that has been uh, moving along for a long, long time and really look at what does this mean now for us? How can we practice those, uh, those skills of, of integrating research, teach, teaching, and engagement through that sustainability uh, perspective? Of course, operations, the investments have already been, uh, been mentioned. Maybe we should start to consider carbon zero. Yeah, and bring, uh, sort of continuously improve and bring that to the next level. So it's an infinitely exciting space. And um, yeah, that is some of the basics uh, that I would like to talk to you about. So in five years, um, Victoria will be nationally and internationally known for its work on sustainability and upheld as an exemplar. That means we have to be able to understand and, and uh, be able to talk about what it is we did well, and in order to do that, of course, we have to go and do it. Um, and I, I think sustainability will be a core integrated approach <laughs> that uh, has demonstrated value, because there is, we do need to make sure that there is value behind it. It's not just an empty story, but it helps, it attracts um, high caliber scientists to Victoria because we do sustainability well. It attracts students to Victoria because we do this well. Uh, and that then adds to, you know, creates value into the, um, um, behind the strategy that's in place. So, my question to you. <laughs> Which line are we choosing? I would like to ask you to, uh, to stand up if you're happy to, uh, to change lines from the reassuring line to the, um, to the inconvenient truth. Can you do that for me? Can you please stand up if, that's, if that is something you actually believe in? If not, then please don't. So now stay standing if you want a change. Please sit down if you don't want a change. Because many people want to change. The question is, who wants to change, because it will require that you yourself do something differently in order to do that. And with that, I think I ask you to sit down again. <laughs> well, the people that were standing, there was, there was a lot. There was not a lot of people that would sit down. I don't think anybody. Well, I would um, say then, we have a whole room full of committed sardines. <laughs> yeah? And this is committed sardines that I'm looking for um, in the first instance. Yeah, so the metaphor goes, you have a, if you're a whale, it takes a long time to turn around. But if you're a school of sardines, you only need a few of them 
to pivot the entire school. Yeah? And, and there's interesting research on that. You only need about 10, 15% of committed people to really turn things around. So here are my committed studies. <laughs> and that doesn't mean we don't need whales, because we do like biodiversity. <laughs> And so what I'm uh, looking for, if you have ideas, if you want to be in contact with us, please send us an email, find us on, uh, on sustainability at uh, That is our new email address, um, and Andrew and I will try and keep an eye on that. And um, yeah, from this is, as I said, the second day on the job, and I am looking forward to meeting lots and lots of people. I will be going through the official... Uh, management line first, but I also want to have coffee with those who are passionate about this, with those who are motivated, yes? And so if you have, uh, if you already, your department already does do a coffee, please invite me. And if not, I'll have to invite, I have to create my own coffee uh, occasions. Yeah, but because I, I do want to hear from the motivated people and I have about three months to really listen to what the ideas are and find the commonality, find the common ground, and out of that create a strategy. So by September there should be a strategy and I will be able to give you a little bit more definite uh, background on what, what I think we can be uh, achieving here. And with that, I'm just really happy to be part of a winning team uh, and I'm looking forward to the next five years. And um, thank you so much for being here today. Looking forward to hearing from you.